All right, so here's objective three in our functions uh, lesson. So objective three, you will be able to classify and evaluate functions. What kind of function is it? Different parts of it? Don't, um, what kind of variables or whatever that you have? And then plug in things in. And that's where this picture comes from. So if you can, this is an advertisement, not in this country. Apparently you could see the, the sockets there, the electrical sockets, they look kind of weird. Um, so down at the bottom right corner, if you can see it, it says, don't expect your food to look after itself. It's some sort of like saran wrap thing. Because um, this piece of cheese is going to be sticking the fork in the electrical socket. So um, I chose this one because that second part of the objective, evaluate functions, that's what you're doing. You're sticking a fork into an electrical socket. No, I mean, you are plugging in a number into your function. You're plugging something in. That's all it is, right? And it's, it's, it's pretty easy to do. So let's talk about the actual names of the variables, of the different kinds of quant uh, variables. So we've already said that functions can be thought of as dependent relations, right? What comes out of a function depends on what you stick into it. So that's exactly what that first part says. So the first one is independent quantity. And you probably talk about independent quantities or independent variables in science class. Maybe you do an experiment, whatever. So your independent quantity is, that is what you get to stick in. That's your x value, right? That's your input value. That's your x values. This is the whole domain. So relate all of those terms together. Your independent quantity, your independent variable, inputs, x values, and domain. Those all go together. Okay. If I stick in a number for my independent quantity, what comes out is the dependent quantity. Its value depends on what I stuck in. The dependent quantity, those are the output values. They're the same thing as the y values. And all of them taken together, of course, is the range. So link all of those words together in your brain. Dependent quantity or variable means the same thing as the output values, the y values, and it's the range. Okay. All right. So this is taken, I believe, from a tax test. I know you're, you're probably saying, I don't take tax anymore. But still, it's, it's, a, it's a question that's asking us about independent versus dependent variables. The number of pretzels P that can be packaged in a box with volume of V cubic units is given by the equation P equals 45V plus 10. Okay, fair enough. In this relation, uh, which is the dependent variable? The dependent variable, I can only figure it out if I know something first. So look at the equation. If I look at the equation, the dependent one is always the one that... Well, it is ordinarily the one that's all by itself. In order to calculate how many pretzels I have, I need to first know the volume. So think of it like this. I'm, I go to the store and I buy some boxes because I'm packing up to go to college. I have a box that's a certain size, and once I know that size, then I can figure out how many things get to go in that box, right? So the de dependent variable is P number of pretzels. Okay. Function notation. In an equation, the dependent variable is usually the y, okay? But we take out, uh, for function notation, we take out the y and we put in f of x instead. f parentheses x, okay? So f, the f there is the name of the function. It doesn't have to be an f. It could be whatever letter that someone chose. It could be g of x, h of x, whatever. Okay? x, whatever's in parentheses, is the independent variable. It's, it's the independent variable. That's why x is always the one that's inside. In science, it might be a t for time, something like that. But in math class, it's usually an x. Of course, it takes place of y, as we already said. f of x. Of in math usually means multiply. The parentheses usually means multiply, but it doesn't in this case. No multiplication. So when I see something like this down at the bottom, f of 3, it doesn't mean f times 3. The x value is 3, and what it means is I take that 3 and I stick it in for x anywhere I see it in the equation. I plug it in, right? 
I read it as f evaluated at 3. Or most people just say f of 3. So let's do some of that right here. Evaluate each of these functions when x is equal to negative 3. So in other words, I'm looking for f of negative 3. Okay? Everywhere on the other side of the equation where I see an x, I'm just going to stick negative 3 in its place. So negative 2 parentheses, negative 3, going to cube it, plus 5. Okay, a negative 2, got to do order of operations, so I got to do the, uh, the exponent here first. So negative 3 times negative 3 is 9, 9 times negative 3 is negative 27, plus 5. Negative times negative makes that positive, so that's 40, 54, 54, plus 5, I get 59. All right, so I write this as f of negative 3 is equal to 59. So this has an advantage. The function notation has an advantage. The advantage is, is that it tells you both the x value and the y value. The x value here is negative 3, and the y value is 50, uh, 59. So, of course, that would correspond to the ordered pair of negative 3, 59. Let's do it over here in number 2. This time I call the function g. Whatever, it doesn't matter. So I'm finding g of negative 3. 12 minus 8 times negative 3. Let's do my order of operations. Uh, negative 8 times negative 3. Is 24, so that makes a 36. G of negative 3 is equal to 36. There we go. If I were going to write that as an ordered pair, negative 3 is the x value, 36 is the y value, right? Yeah, not bad. Pretty easy. Okay. So take a look at the different kinds of functions. I kind of hinted at this in a previous, um, a previous exercise or whatever. We're talking about being able to distinguish between a linear function and a nonlinear function. It's pretty simple. Take a look in the table. On the left-hand side, you've got nothing but linear functions. Over there on the right-hand side, these are nonlinear functions. If a function is not linear, then it must be nonlinear, right? Two opposites, mutually exclusive. So just take a second, pause it if you need to, and see if you can figure out, if I just have an equation, how are you supposed to tell if it's linear or not? Okay? All right. So to be a linear function, the highest power has to be just a 1. Remember, we've said that before. These are all to the first power. Think of it as y equals mx plus b. If you cannot write it as y equals mx plus b, it is not a linear function. So over here on the, the second side, this one fails because the highest power is 2. The second one, g of x, fails because this x is on the denominator. You can't have that for a linear function. Um, we're going to learn that that has a power x to the negative 1. Maybe you did that in, in um, like algebra 1? I don't remember. Okay, and then the other one, uh, h of x, it's not linear because... It has an absolute value. When we graph these at the end of this unit, you're going to see that this graph is a V-shape. It's a broken line, so that can't be a linear function. Okay? All right, so let's look back. Which of these things are linear or nonlinear? Since number 1 has a cube in it, that's not a 1, this is nonlinear function. Nonlinear. Okay, and if I look at 2 for G of X, it just has negative 8x in it. It could be written as y equals mx plus b. So this one is linear. It's a linear function. And that's it. That's all it takes. Okay, so that wraps up this objective. We have one more about uh, continuous versus discrete. All right, I uh, decided that this long lesson wasn't quite long enough. So I crammed in an extra exercise. Uh, actually, I just wanted you to get exposure to something that's a little bit more challenging for evaluating a function. Okay, so it says for f of x equals, and then gives us a, a quadratic function, a nonlinear function, find f of x plus h. So I am evaluating the function not at a number, but at a variable expression, x plus h, which just means that I'm going to take this x plus h, that whole thing, 
and I'm going to stick it in for x there and there and simplify the whole thing. Okay? And I'll get some probably scary looking equation at the end. So f of x plus h. Now everywhere I see an x, take it out, and I'm going to put x plus h in its place. So 3, open the parentheses, x plus h squared minus 5 times x plus h, and then plus 7. Okay, so I can't distribute the 3 yet. I have to square those parentheses. And squaring doesn't mean just give the two things inside a square. Okay, it means multiply times itself. I'm going to do it right up above, x plus h times x plus h. And I'm going to FOIL it. Sure, there is a shortcut involved in doing this, and, and we'll learn out about it later, or maybe you remember it and so you could use it. So FOILing first, uh, first terms is x squared outside xh, inside also an xh, and then finally last terms h squared. The two that are in the middle, they're the same, so they can add up, and I got two of them. So x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So that's going to go in the first set of parentheses after this 3 here. So 3 times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Close the parentheses. And now I can go ahead and distribute this negative 5 through this second set of parentheses. Minus 5x minus 5h and then finally plus 7. Uh, now distribute the 3 on this first set. 3x squared plus 6xh plus 3h squared. And then copy down the rest of it. Minus 5x minus 5h plus 7. And of course if there were any like terms that's what you do. You uh, combine your like terms. So f of x plus h, but I don't see any here. Do you? Here? Here? Okay. There's our answer. I know you're going, geez, what the heck was the point of that? But you will see the point, I promise you. You'll have a project that you'll have uh, quite a bit of that to do whenever we talk about difference quotients. We have just done one part of it right there when we found f of x plus h in it. Really? It's like calculus, calculus light. You've just done a little bit, okay? All right.